On a beautiful spring morning, we were assembled at Trevda, where Hals had spent such an enjoyable time. Two other companies joined us on a hillside covered with short, velvety grass, the kind which thrusts up so thickly that each blade seems to be fighting for space, and which becomes a tall savanna within a month. There were about nine hundred of us. A group of officers standing on the platform of a half-destroyed truck addressed us from the top of the hill. About twenty flags and regimental pennants had been propped around the base of the truck. The speeches were very courteous. We were even congratulated for our attitude in the past, an attitude which made us feel ashamed whenever we heard any bulletins from the front. We stared at the officers with enormous eyes. They said that because of our attitude, they were prepared to honour any one of us who might wish it by transferring him to a combat unit. About twenty men volunteered at once. The officers, recognising our timidity, tried to put us at our ease and went on talking in the same style. Certain heroic actions were described in detail. Fifteen more volunteers stepped out of the ranks, among them Lenson, who was clearly born for trouble. Next, the officers mentioned a fortnight's leave, which produced at least three hundred volunteers. Then several lieutenants stepped down from the platform. They threaded their way through our ranks, selecting individual men and inviting them to take the three fateful steps forward, while a captain maintained the tone of eloquent pressure. The men chosen were always among the largest, healthiest and strongest. Suddenly, an index finger sheathed in black leather was pointing, like the barrel of a mauser, into the ribs of my best friend, my war brother. As if hypnotised, Howells took three large steps and the sound of his heels as he snapped them together was like a door slamming shut, a door which threatened to separate me, perhaps forever, from the only real friend I had ever made, and from the friendship which was my only incentive for life in the midst of despair. After a moment's hesitation, I joined the group of volunteers without any further pressure. I looked confusedly at Hals, whose face was glowing like the face of a child who has just been given a delightful surprise, and who doesn't know what to say. Henceforth, my identification would be Gefreiter Sager, G100-1010 G4. Siebzentes Bataillon, Leicht Infanterie Gross Deutschland Division, Sud G. In the evening, we went back to the squalid shelters we had already occupied. Nothing seemed to have changed. The fact that our names had been added to the infantry recruitment lists was the only difference between the life we had led yesterday as truck drivers and our new life as combat troops. We felt somewhat confused as to the attitude we should adopt, but our non-coms allowed us very little time for meditation. They kept us busy cleaning up and restoring to good condition the weapons which had taken a beating during the last battle, a job which took several days. Everything seemed to have quieted down, although strong Soviet counter-thrusts had started several fires to the northeast at Slavyansk. We were also used for the revolting chore of burying the thousands of men who had died in the battle for Kharkov. We were officially designated burial squad one morning at dawn. The light was so faint it was still almost as dark as the middle of the night. Laos informed us that our new job would take the place of the fortnight's leave we had been promised and were so much looking forward to. As a rule, the Russian prisoners were used to bury the dead, but it seemed they had taken to robbing the bodies stealing wedding rings and other pieces of jewellery. In fact, I think the poor fellows, many of them wounded but designated fit for work, were probably going over the bodies for something to eat. The rations we gave them were absurd. For example, one three-quart mess tin of weak soup for every four prisoners every 24 hours. On some days they were given nothing but water. Every prisoner caught robbing a German body was immediately shot. There were no official firing squads for these executions. An officer would simply shoot the offender on the spot or hand him over to a couple of toughs who were regularly given this sort of job. Once, to my horror, I saw one of these thugs tying the hands of three prisoners to the bars of a gate. When his victims had been secured, he stuck a grenade into the pocket of one of their coats, pulled the pin and ran for shelter. The three Russians, whose guts were blown out, screamed for mercy until the last moment. Although we had already met birds of every colour, these proceedings revolted us so much that violent arguments broke out between us and these criminals every time. They invariably became furious and abusive, shouting insults at us. 
They said they had escaped from the camp at Tomvos, where the Russians dumped German prisoners, and they told us how our countrymen were being slaughtered. According to them, the infamous Tomvos camp, 60 miles east of Moscow, was an extermination camp. Rations, as ludicrous as those we handed out to Russian prisoners at Kharkov, were served once a day to men reporting for labour. Men who did not work received nothing. One bowl of millet was provided for every four men. There was never enough, even for the prisoners who could work. The daily surplus was simply killed. A favourite method of execution was to hammer an empty cartridge case into the nape of the prisoner's neck. It seemed that the Russians often distracted themselves with this type of sport. I myself can well believe that the Russians were capable of this kind of cruelty, after seeing them at work among the pitiful columns of refugees in East Prussia. But Russian excesses did not in any way excuse us for the excesses by our own side. War always reaches the depths of horror, because of idiots who perpetuate terror from generation to generation under the pretext of vengeance. We spent hours digging out a long tunnel which had been turned into an emergency hospital during the fighting. The surgeons had been so overloaded that the wounded had almost certainly been abandoned. A line of rough triple-decker beds extended some hundreds of yards down the corridor, each containing three blackened, stiff and mutilated bodies. From time to time an empty space marked the final flight of a dying man. There was no light in this charnel house except from the electric torches which some of us had fastened to our tunics. These threw beams of horrifying illumination on the thin, swollen faces of the cadavers, which we had to pull out with hooks. Finally, one delicious spring morning, incongruous in that sad, ruined landscape, a muddy truck drove down the track to the new barracks we had moved into the day before. After a brisk half-turn, it stopped about ten yards from the first building, where a group of men which included myself were busy removing a heap of gravel and small stones. The back flap of the truck was kicked open, and a plump little corporal jumped down and clicked his heels. Without saluting or saying a word, he rummaged in his right breast pocket where all military instructions were supposed to be kept. He pulled out a sheet of paper which had been carefully folded four times, and read out a long list of names, as he read, he indicated with a wave of his hand that the men named should step to the right. There were about 100 names on the list, among them Ollensheim, Lenson, Hals, and Sager. Feeling somewhat anxious, I joined the group on the right. The corporal told us we had three minutes to climb aboard the truck with our weapons and packs. Then he clicked his heels again, saluting this time, and turned his back without another word, striding off as if he were suddenly going for a walk. We ran frantically to collect our things. There was no time for conversation. Three minutes later, a hundred breathless soldiers were packed into the truck, whose bulging sides threatened to collapse. The corporal was also on time. He threw a withering glance at the eccentrically bulging packs some of us were carrying, but said nothing. Then he bent down to look at something under the truck. No more than forty-five on board, he barked. Departure in thirty seconds. He took another hundred paces. We all groaned silently. No one wanted to get down. Everyone had the best of reasons for staying put. Two or three men were shoved off the back. As I was right in the middle, packed in like a sardine, there was no question of moving. Laos finally took matters in hand. He made half the men on the truck get down. The remainder came to exactly forty-five. The corporal, who was already climbing into the front seat, told the driver to start. Laos gave us a friendly wave. We had received our final orders from him. His last smile more than made up in our eyes for all the duties he had imposed on us. Beside him, the other half of the group called out by the corporal watched with dazed faces as we vanished in a whirl of dust. This half of the group joined us four days later, one hundred miles behind the front lines, at the rest camp of the famous Gross Deutschland Division. A large part of the division, especially the convalescing wounded, occupied the rustic Aktyrka camp. The division itself held a mobile sector in the vast Kursk-Belgorod region. Everything at the camp was clean and neatly organised, as in the Boy Scouts, only far more lavishly supplied. Aktyrka reminded us of an oasis surrounded by the trackless steppe. We jumped down at the corporal's order and lined up in a double file. A captain, a first lieutenant, 
and a Feldwebel walked toward us. Our plump little corporal snapped to attention. These officers were all dressed with astonishing style. The Hauptmann looked like a figure from a costume party, in a jacket of fine grey-green cloth with the red facings of a combat unit, dark green riding breeches and gleaming cavalry boots. He waved at us, and then said something we couldn't quite hear to the Feldwebel, who was every bit his equal in elegance. After a short conversation with the Hauptmann, the Feld walked over to us, clicked his heels, and addressed us in a tone which at least was more agreeable than that of the corporal who had come to fetch us. Welcome to the Gross Deutschland Division, he shouted. With us, you will experience a genuine soldier's life, the only life which brings men close to each other on terms of absolute sincerity. Here a sense of comradeship exists between each and every one of us, which might be put to the test at any moment. Any black sheep, anyone unsuited for comradeship, does not stay in this division. Everyone must be able to count on everyone else, without any qualification whatever. The slightest error on anyone's part affects the whole section. We want no slackers and no strays. Everyone must be prepared either to obey without question or to give orders. Your officers will think for you. Your duty is to show yourselves worthy of them. You will now get yourselves some new clothes and throw away your stinking rags. Absolute cleanliness is the essential foundation for a decent frame of mind. We do not tolerate any sloppiness of appearance. He took a deep breath and then continued. When these preliminaries have been accomplished, this group of volunteers will receive their passes for the fortnight's leave, which has been promised them. If there is no counter-order, these passes will become effective in five days, when the convoy leaves for Nedrigailov. You may now proceed. Heil Hitler! It was a beautiful day. Everything in the camp seemed to be efficiently organised. According to what we'd just heard, one did not trifle with orders. But that seemed a reasonable change, after the universe of shit and horror and suffering and panic we had just come from. And then there were our passes. Hals was jumping with delight like a young goat. Everyone felt overjoyed. Our plump corporal had one more nasty surprise in store for us, but we were all in such a good humour nothing could ruffle us. He ordered us to wash our filthy clothes before turning them into the supply store where we would draw new ones. We found ourselves transformed into washerwomen, standing stripped to the skin in front of long troughs. Our underclothes were caked with filth, beyond hope of recovery. I kicked my shorts into the air and tore my undershirt into shreds. My last pair of socks, which I'd been wearing since the beginning of the retreat, were nothing but holes and joined my shorts. Then, stark naked, we walked across the grass to the store to hand in our old clothes, which were soaking wet but neatly folded and receive new ones. Two women soldiers nearly choked with laughter when they saw us coming. Hang on to your boots, shouted the sergeant, who was not particularly amused by the sight of naked boys. No new boots here. We were given a fresh issue of everything from caps to first aid kits. However, certain indispensable items were missing among these, underpants and socks, which in the long run proved to be serious omissions. But our spirits were too high to be disturbed at the time. When we were dressed, we were directed to a wooden army barrack. A notice in large, legible characters was tacked beside the door to remind us of the cleanliness which was officially obligatory. Eine Laus der Todd. Asterisk. A Laus means death. The plump little corporal who had accompanied us from Kharkov waved us inside. We looked curiously around our new room, which was rough but impeccably clean. Rue, mensch, shouted the corporal. We instantly fell silent. Since there isn't a non-com here, I'm going to put one of you in charge. He worked his way through our ranks, with his eyes half-closed, as if he wished to surprise his choice, who of course would not want the responsibility or as if the decision were somehow significant. Finally, with a sharp cry, he selected a fellow who didn't seem to have anything special about him. Duh! The man he pointed to stepped forward. Your name? Wiedebeck. Wiedebeck, until further notice, you will be responsible for the order of this room. You will go to the Warenlager to pick up the divisional patches which everyone must sew on his left sleeve. You will also... He enumerated a list of duties, each of which made poor Wiedebeck's head droop a little lower. 
A few minutes later, we each received the famous insignia of the Gross Deutschland division, with its divisional title in silver Gothic letters on a black ground. This band remained on my sleeve until 1945, when the rumour ran through our scattered ranks that the Americans were shooting any man wearing a divisional name instead of a number. And at that moment of hasty judgment, they might very well have shot a nobody from the Gross Deutschland or the Brandenburg as easily as a hero from the Leibstandarte or the Totenkopf. But that time was still far in the future. We were then in the spring of 1943, on the territory of a conquered country. The weather was marvellous, and as a finishing touch we all had two-week passes in our pockets. After everything we had been through, this new life seemed like a dream. Except for morning and evening roll call, we were free to wander about and entertain ourselves as we pleased. Aktirka was a curious place. Between the houses, or groups of houses, which were built in an agreeable Russian peasant style, the grasses and wild flowers of the steppe grew with vigorous abundance, making a kind of thick lawn, which was often nearly three feet high. These plants and grasses, which all turned brown at the end of summer, were scattered with enormous daisies and a variety of aromatic plants which the Russians collected for seasoning their food and preparing drinks. Fields of rough, light green gherkins were set off by enormous sunflowers. The groups of houses were inhabited either by members of a family or by friends, who built in clusters to reduce the effort of paying visits. The Russians, especially the Ukrainians, are very gay and hospitable and ready to celebrate almost any occasion. I remember several pleasant gatherings at the homes of these enthusiastic people, during which everyone managed to forget the rivalries of the war. And I remember the girls, shouting with laughter when they had every reason to hate us, on another human scale altogether from the affected Parisian beauty, obsessed by her appearance and her cosmetics. Each group of houses also had its own burial ground, which was never a sad place, but always a beautiful flowery plot, with wooden tables where people often sat and drank, and an ornamental signpost with an affectionate variation of the place name, Beautiful Aktirka, our town Aktirka, sweet Aktirka. Four days after our arrival, the second section of our group of volunteers joined us. It seemed they really had to sweat to make it. Almost the whole journey had been on foot. At last, on the fifth day, we took our places in the convoy for Nedrigailov. Our passes would not become operative until we reached Poznan, which was another thousand miles to the west. After that, there would be six hundred miles to my parents at Wissemburg. I would therefore be travelling for several days. We drove across a huge expanse of country which was absolutely flat, without the slightest trace of hillock or hollow. Here and there we could see military tractors being used for agricultural work. We were able to maintain a decent speed as far as Nedrigailov on a road which had been rebuilt by the army engineers, and which every three or four miles was littered with the wreckage of hastily abandoned Soviet material. We had driven for about 150 miles when our attention was attracted by some tiny shapes outlined against the distant sky. Their black silhouettes were marked by little white clouds and the sound of explosions. The two trucks ahead of us slowed down and then stopped. As usual, the Feld responsible for the convoy jumped down from the first truck and stared through his field glasses. As usual, we waited for an order before plunging to the ground. Everyone was quiet, watching the Feld attentively, trying to fathom his reactions. Only the sound of the idling engine broke the stillness. The joy which had transformed our faces these last few days slowly faded as our anxiety grew. A few voices cursed our bad luck. I thought that by now we were good and far from any trouble. God damn it! What do you think it could be? Partisans, muttered Hals, who had already taken part in a manhunt. There were several other conjectures as well. Whoever they are, I'm not going to let the bastards wreck my leave. I wonder what we're waiting for. Why don't they just tell us to go ahead and shoot them? Each of us had already picked up the Mauser, which soldiers on leave in an occupied country were required to carry at all times. The idea that somebody or something might prevent us from going home made us feel savage. We were ready to shoot anyone at a moment's notice if that's what was needed to keep moving west. But the order to fire never came. 
The Feld climbed back onto his truck and the convoy started off again. We stared at each other in confusion. When, some 500 yards further on, we ran into a group of 20 German officers carrying shotguns, we felt so surprised and delighted that our assumption had been mistaken that we cheered them as if we were driving past the Führer himself. At last we reached Nedrigailov, where we left the convoy, which turned south. We went on to Romney, the gypsy paradise, where we were supposed to be picked up by another convoy moving west. At Nedrigailov, our ranks were swelled by other men on leave from various parts of Russia, until there were nearly a thousand of us. However, the supply of available trucks had to be used for many purposes, other than simply transporting men on leave. The few trucks for Romney took on about 20 fortunate souls. The rest of us were left to mill about in front of a field kitchen, equipped to feed barely a quarter of our number. Although we were famished, we decided to walk the 30 miles to Romney, and set off despite the lateness of the hour, in the best of spirits. About twenty fellows who were considerably older than the rest of us and belonged to the Gross Deutschland division came along. There were also seven or eight fellows from the SS who sang at the tops of their lungs. The others took swigs from bottles which they passed from hand to hand. They must have emptied several cellars. Every one of them seemed to be carrying a generous collection. We had instinctively arranged ourselves in threes, as if we were going up to the line, and were proceeding on the double, consciously reducing the distance which separated us from Romney. Evening was slowly falling across the endless green rolling landscape. Our uniforms, so perfectly matched to outdoor colours, seemed to take on the tone of the surrounding landscape, like chameleon skins. After the first ten miles, our high spirits faded somewhat, leaving us more inclined to contemplate the immense panorama of the Ukraine. The earth, engaged in the processes of spring germination, exhaled a subtle but nonetheless powerful odour as the horizon faded into the boundless emptiness of the darkening sky. Our uniforms grew darker as the earth darkened, almost as if by magic, and our footsteps seemed to be setting the rhythm of the whole mysterious universe. The blackness of night was spreading behind us and we fell silent, hushed by the respect which immensity imposes on simple men. Our group of soldiers, members of an army hated throughout the world, was seized by an indefinable emotion. As one sometimes jokes to hide sadness, we began to sing to avoid thought. The favourite song of the SS rose up like a hymn to the earth, offered to men. So wait, die brauner Heide get, gehort das alles wir. Then darkness engulfed us, a darkness which, for the first time in months, seemed made for nothing more than watching over us. Although we had begun to feel our exhaustion, no one suggested a halt. The road home was long, and we didn't want to lose any time. For me, hoping to reach my other country, the road was even longer. Although our leave did not officially begin until Poznan, the idea of getting home overrode every other consideration, and enabled me to endure the painful condition of my bare feet, rubbed raw by my boots. Hals, who was having the same sort of trouble, cursed the storekeeper at Aktirka for failing to supply us with socks. After about twenty miles we were forced to reduce our speed. Naturally the veterans who had joined us, and whose feet must have been made of iron, treated us like crybabies. But they gave us their own socks, so that we could go on. For a few of us, however, this was not enough. Our feet were too lacerated, and the three additional miles we were able to manage cost us too much pain. As the rest of the group kept on despite our cries pleading for a halt, we decided to try walking barefoot on the dewy grass. At first this seemed like an improvement, but not for long. Some even thought of wrapping their feet in the new undershirts we had been issued, but the possibility of an inspection made them hesitate. The last few miles, as we hobbled through the growing daylight, were torture, a torture refined by the first military police we met on the outskirts of Romney who made us put back our boots. They said they wouldn't allow us into town looking like a bunch of tramps. We could knave murdered them. Further on, we asked some gypsies to take the worst cases as far as the commandantur in their carts. They were prudent enough not to argue. The infirmary was in the same building as the commandantur. We even spoke with the commandant, who was outraged that soldiers from the Gross Deutschland should have to go without socks. 
he sent an official statement of indignation to the Aktyurka camp for failing to provide properly for new troops. Those who wished medical attention were sent to the infirmary, where their feet were washed in basins of warm water to which chloroform had been added. This had an extraordinary effect, easing our pain almost at once. We were each given a small red metal box of cream for coating our feet before setting out on a march, but we still had no socks. Those of our group who had not gone to the infirmary were looking into the prospects for the rest of our journey. The Kharkov-Kiev line ran through Romney, with daily trains in both directions. Our disappointment, therefore, was great when our two Feldwebels announced that we wouldn't be leaving for at least two days. All available space on trains moving toward the front was reserved for essentials, and on returning trains emergencies were given priority over soldiers on leave. Rumours multiplied among our group of 500 anxious men for whom each hour counted. People spoke of leaving for Kiev on their own, thumbing a ride on one of the convoys, or sneaking onto a train on the quiet, or stealing some Russian horses. Some even spoke of doing the journey on foot, 150 miles, which would take at least five days, even with forced marches. As all of these were really out of the question, we decided it would be better simply to stay where we were. Old hands groaned. I can tell you, we'll just sit here and watch our passes expire. We've got to get out of here. Who says we'll leave in two days? We'll probably be right where we are a week from now. So fuck the whole damn mess, I'm clearing out. My feet were still feeling too sensitive even to think about a march, no matter how pressing it might be. Hals and Lenson were in the same state, so for better or for worse, we had to wait in Romney without any idea of what to do or even where to sleep. The police were always after us, telling us to move on. It was useless to try to explain to them the bastards weren't interested. In the Ukraine, that paradise for troops on leave, they had rediscovered all the exasperating authority they exercised in peacetime. Anyone rash enough to argue with them risked having his pass torn up in front of his eyes. We saw this happen to one poor devil about 40 years old. The gendarmes kicked his pack like some kind of football, and the fellow remarked in an angry voice that he had just spent six months fighting in the Caucasus, and felt entitled to a certain amount of common courtesy. Traitors! shouted one of the horrible cops. Traitors who ran away from the Russians and lost Rostov! They should send the whole lot of you back to the front, which you never should have left in the first place. And he ripped the poor man's pass into shreds before his horrified eyes. We thought he would break down and howl. Instead, he threw himself on the two cops, knocking both of them flat. He was gone before we could recover from our stupefaction. The furious cops picked themselves up, swearing to have the man shot. We took ourselves off in a hurry, before they had the chance to turn their guns on us. Two days later we left for Kiev after all, crammed into a train which was also loaded with cattle. But we didn't care about travelling in comfort. We were interested only in getting to Kiev, which several months before its destruction was still a beautiful city. In Kiev we felt that we had been saved, that the war no longer existed. The city looked beautiful and was full of flowers. People were going quietly about their ordinary everyday occupations. White street cars, edged in red, moved through the brightly dressed civilian crowds of the pleasant town. Everywhere, troops in trim, brushed uniforms were walking with Ukrainian girls. I had already liked the look of the town in the winter. Now all my agreeable impressions were confirmed. I would gladly have ended the war right there. From Kiev, we had no trouble finding a train leaving for Poland. Our journey was vivid and colourful. We left in a crowded civilian train and, mixed in this way with ordinary Russian people, had more of a chance to become acquainted with them than at any time during the war. Our train of oddly assorted carriages rolled for hours along a track that crossed the empty expanse of the Pripe marshes. The Russians, who drank and sang non-stop, offered drinks to all the soldiers too, and the noise throughout the journey was almost beyond belief. At the occasional station stops, people got on and off, and the most outrageous jokes were cracked amid shouts of laughter. The women made even more noise than the men. Hals put on a guharichka for a short time. We passed in this way from the Ukraine into Poland, arriving after two and a half days in Lublin, where we had to change trains. At Lublin there was also a meticulous police inspection. 
and we were ordered to go to the camp barber for haircuts before departure. However, our anxiety about missing the train was so great that we decided to take what seemed like an enormous risk, which succeeded. Hals, Lenson and I managed to walk out past the military police with our hair untouched by any shears. This proved to have been a risk well worth taking, as without it we would surely have missed the train. We arrived at Poznan in the middle of the night and were received by a very efficient centre. We were given tickets for the canteen and the dormitory and told to be at the office in the morning to have our passes validated. The office was open from 7 to 11, but we were warned to be there no later than 6, as there was usually a queue. This struck us as somewhat strange. In effect, it meant that troops arriving in Poznan at 11.05 in the morning had to wait until the following day before they could continue their journey. I think this arrangement was probably motivated by a desire to keep men under army control, even when they were theoretically on leave. In this way, a cancellation order could be sent east while the troops were waiting. By contrast, the office which processed returning troops was open 24 hours a day. We spent what was left of the night in a comfortable dormitory, which reminded me of the barracks at Chemnitz, and were at the office for passes by six the next morning. There were already some 20 men ahead of us, who must have spent the night on the spot, and by seven there must have been at least 300. The self-important bureaucrats who ran the place took their own time verifying our documents while we stood in agitated silence. The police standing by the door were ready to cancel the leave of anyone foolish enough to lose his temper. When our papers had been stamped, we were sent across the courtyard into a large hall where our uniforms were inspected. We were given the opportunity to polish our boots and brush our clothes beforehand, and one might almost have believed that there was no mud in Russia. Then a final charming detail. Women soldiers distributed packages of choice foods wrapped in paper covered with eagles and swastikas and inscribed, A happy holiday to our brave soldiers. Sweet, sensitive Germany. Hals, who would have been capable of killing himself for a cup of beef broth, rolled enormous eyes. If we'd only had something like this at Kharkov. We felt profoundly moved by these attentions. A package of sausages, jam and cigarettes seemed generous repayment for our endless nights in the stone-cracking cold and our wanderings through the mud of the Don Valley. Hals and I set off for Berlin, bearing our gifts. Lenson left us to travel to his native Prussia. In Berlin, we were once again reminded of the war's existence. Around the Silesian station and in the Weissensee and Pankow districts, many buildings had been reduced to rubble, in the first stages of the city's destruction. But otherwise, the active, busy life of a capital metropolis went on as usual. In Berlin, which I was seeing for the first time, I was reminded of a promise I had made. I had promised myself to go see Ernest Neubach's wife. She lived with his parents in the southern part of the city. I explained this to Hals, who advised me to postpone the obligation until my return trip but I knew very well that I would never be able to bring myself to leave home a day early and that my parents would try to hang on to me until the last moment. Hals understood this, even though he tried to persuade me to do something else. He didn't want to lose any time either and left for Dortmund as soon as he could, making me promise to come to see him. I would have done better to listen to the voice of wisdom speaking through my friend. My journey came to an end the next day in the flames of Magdeburg, and I had to stay in Berlin, a city entirely unknown to me, where I had to work hard to make myself understood. Still carrying my pack and gun, which were beginning to feel very heavy, I set out to try to find the Neubach's house. Fortunately, I was still able to read the scribbled address I had found among my poor friend's papers. But should I try to get there by subway or by bus? As I really didn't know where I was going, I decided to proceed on foot, which would at least give me the chance to look around. The idea of walking across the city still seemed normal at that time. However, I didn't want to stray too far afield, to walk west when I should have been walking south. I had noticed a sign, Berlin Sud, which must be roughly correct. I passed two cops who gave me a long, cold stare when they noticed the spectacular package of a soldier on leave. I saluted them as required. One had to salute those bastards as if they were army officers and went on my way.
The city seemed beautiful, but serious and well organized. The bombing had only recently begun, and in Berlin affected only the districts immediately around the railway stations. In this large, imposing town, with its austere houses set off by sumptuous, intricate railings, everything seemed to be regulated by a precise, organized rhythm. No raucous crowds or parents pulling down their children's pants to let them pee. Men, women, children, bicycles, cars and trucks all seemed to be moving at an even, regular pace toward a precise destination, with a rhythm that seemed conscious and assertive, and designed to avoid any dissipation of energy. It was all very different from Paris, for example. Undue haste seemed out of place, and my legs seemed to fall instinctively into the accepted tempo of the city. To stop moving without good reason would have seemed strange. The huge machine which the regime had set in motion for the cause was turning, and this was evident even in the gestures of the little old lady who was walking just ahead of me, and whom I stopped to ask for directions. Her neat white hair was impeccable, like the streets and the railings and the edges of the sidewalks. The sound of my voice seemed to call her back from some distant daydream. Excuse me, Gnadige Frau, I said, feeling somewhat embarrassed, as if I were speaking in a theatre where the play had already begun. Could you give me some directions? I am going to this address. I showed her my scrap of paper, which really looked like something pulled out of a waste paper basket. The old lady smiled, as if she had seen an angel. It's very far, young man, she said in a gentle voice, which suddenly reminded me of my childhood. It's very far. You must go to the Tempelhof Autobahn, but it's really very far. That doesn't matter. I couldn't think of anything else to say. You really ought to take a bus. It would be much easier for you. That doesn't matter, I repeated, like someone in a dream. In fact, I couldn't think of the German words for anything else. This woman's obvious goodness, after so much loud-mouthed bullying and malignity, moved me even more deeply than the exhausted men at Auchenny. I don't mind walking. I'm in the infantry, I finally said, smiling. I know, she said, smiling even more tenderly than a moment before. You must be used to walking. I'll go with you as far as the Schloss von Kaiser Wilhelm. From there, I'll be able to explain to you. She walked along beside me. As I didn't know what to say, the burden of the conversation fell on her. Where have you come from, young man? From Russia. Russia's a big country. What part were you in? Russia's very big, yes. I was in the south, around Kharkov. Kharkov, she said, giving the name a very German sound. I see. Is it a big town? Yes, it's big. For my kindly companion, Kharkov was clearly nothing more than a name which there was no particular need to remember. For me, Kharkov meant a city which had lost its life. If it had ever been a big town, it was now only a heap of rubble, crowned by a cloud of dust, smoke and fire. It was also the sound of cries and moaning one shouldn't hear in towns. It was a long corridor of stiffened corpses we had to drag out into the air, and three Bolsheviks tied to a fence, with their guts spilling from their bellies. My son is in Bryansk, the old lady remarked, clearly hoping for news of the front. Bryansk, I repeated in a thoughtful tone. I believe that's in the central sector. I've never been there. He tells me that everything's going quite well. He's a first lieutenant in an armoured division. A lieutenant, I thought. An officer. The opinions of a private soldier must have sounded ridiculous. Were things difficult in your sector? Things were pretty hard, but they're better now. I'm on leave, I added, smiling. I'm really happy for you, young man, she said, and her voice sounded as if she meant it. Are you in Berlin to see your family? No, Nadiga Frau, I'm going to see the parents of a friend. A friend? Ernst. A corpse. What friend was I tramping along like this for? The old woman was beginning to get on my nerves. A friend from your regiment, she said, sharing my pleasure at being on leave. I felt like knocking her onto one of those intricate railings full of spikes. Where do your parents come from? she asked. From Wissenburg in Alsace? She looked at me with surprise. So you're Alsatian. I know Alsace very well. I almost told her that she knew it better than I did. Yes, I'm Alsatian, I said, 
hoping to get a little peace. She began to tell me about a trip she'd taken to Strasbourg, but I wasn't listening anymore. By forcing me to remember Ernst, she had irritated me. I had better things to do than listen to this old bird reminisce about her travels. It was a beautiful day, I was on leave, and I needed to see something gay. This desire made me wonder what attitude to take when I got to the Neubachs. These people had just lost their son, and were probably overwhelmed by grief. Maybe they didn't even know he was dead. If that's how it was, what on earth could I say to them? It would be better to visit them on my way back. By then they would surely have been told. Hals was right, I should have listened to him. He, at least, was still alive. We came to a crossroad opposite a bridge over a stream, or even perhaps a large river. I knew that the Seine flowed through Paris, but couldn't have said whether Berlin was on the Elbe or the Oder. To the right there was a massive block of buildings, the Schloss von Kaiser Wilhelmund, directly across the avenue, an impressive memorial to the heroes of 1914 to 18. Twelve hundred helmets of that time set round a forecourt to give some idea of the sacrifice. Two sentries from Hitler's guard walked slowly back and forth along a cement apron at the base of the monument. Their slow, even pace seemed to me strangely symbolic of a human being's slow progress toward eternity, with a regularity which a master watchmaker might well have envied. The two men executed impeccably synchronised half-turns, faced each other at a distance of about thirty metres, resumed their march, crossed, turned and began again. I found this spectacle somehow oppressive. Here we are, young man, the old woman said. You cross the bridge and follow that avenue. She pointed toward the vast, stony backdrop of the city, in which I would have to find my address. But I had already stopped listening. I knew that I wasn't going to the Neubachs, and that these explanations were superfluous. Nevertheless, I outdid myself in expressions of gratitude and pressed the old lady's hand. She withdrew repeating her protestations of goodwill. I couldn't help smiling. As soon as she had disappeared, I rushed back in the direction from which we'd come, trying to make up for lost time and find the station for the west as quickly as possible. I walked along the riverbank with the obsessive speed of a maniac. Suddenly, the air filled with martial music and an elegantly dressed military band marched out through a tall gateway and turned into the street. I remembered what we were taught at Bialystok, and snapped to attention, presenting arms to the indifferent troop. After an hour and a half, with innumerable stops to ask my way, I arrived at the station from which trains left for the West and France. I looked desperately for Hals amid the throngs on the platform. He would surely be on this train too, but I couldn't find him in the few minutes before departure. As I caught my breath on the train, the slow, regular progress of our acceleration seemed to merge with the measured tempo of the German capital. Everything here was so entirely different from Russia. Even the soldiers had an air of seriousness which matched the civilised, organised life of all large European countries. The contrast with Russia was so great that I wondered if what I'd seen there wasn't part of a bad dream. Night fell and the train rolled on. We had been moving for at least three hours, during which it seemed that we had never left the city. There was no countryside, only buildings. Suddenly the train came to a stop, although we were not in a station. Everyone leaned out the windows to see what was happening. Although it was dark, the distant sky glowed with red light. We could hear a muffled rumbling, mingled with the boom of guns. The throbbing of a mass of airplanes overhead rattled the windows of the train. That must be Magdeburg getting it in the neck, said a soldier who had shoved in beside me to look out too. Who's giving it to them? I asked. He looked at me curiously. Those Yankee bastards, of course, he said, as if he were talking to a simpleton. Things are just as hot here as they are at the front. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the glow of the burning city. I had thought that we'd left the war far behind us. The train began to move again, only to come to a fresh halt fifteen minutes later. Soldiers ran up the track, calling everybody off. Somebody said that the line had been cut and that all military personnel, whether on active duty or on leave, had to put themselves at the disposal of the local authorities. Thus I found myself, in my clean uniform and carrying my holiday package, falling into step with about a hundred resigned soldiers. 
We walked for about half an hour into the blinding, acrid smoke of countless fires and began shifting fallen timbers and massive masonry blocks while delayed action bombs pulverised what was left of a terrified bourgeois population. Groups of whimpering civilians were impressed into clean-up squads by foul-mouthed officials shouting at the tops of their lungs. Everyone was put to work. Although it was pitch dark, we were able to see. Broken gas pipes thrown up onto the torn earth blazed like blowtorches, amid the heaps of stones, broken wood, window glass, furniture, arms and legs. A gang of territorials handed out picks, and we piled the rest of our equipment beside a fire truck. We had to dig into the ruins with the greatest possible speed. We could hear the groans and cries of people trapped in the cellars. Women and children weeping with terror were carting away bricks and stones to clear some space. Shouted orders overlapped. Quick, this way! We need help over here. Quick, the water pipes have burst and are flooding the cellars. Of course, the military were chosen to deal with the most dangerous situations and sent into places threatened with immediate collapse. We reached the cellars through the deep air shafts. We attacked a brick wall which seemed to be blocking the entrance to a basement where people were calling for help. My pick sank into something soft, probably the stomach of some poor soul crushed by the debris. And damn it, I was on leave and all of this was holding me up. An explosion shifted the ground we were standing on. Another one of those American bombs which blow up some time after they've landed. Nonetheless, our efforts were finally successful. The last brick wall fell beneath our blows, and a bunch of haggard, blackened people surged through the jagged opening, engulfed in a swirling cloud of dust. Several people embraced us, sobbing with relief and recognition. Others were in a state of literal madness. Everyone was somehow hurt or wounded. We had to climb down ourselves to bring out terrified women clutching their children so tightly they were nearly suffocating them. I pulled out the first child I saw. A kid of about five was tugging at one of my trouser legs so hard that it came right out of my boot. He was trying to drag me to a particular spot, and he was crying so hard that his gasps for breath between each sob were extraordinarily long. He pulled me over to a recess where a crushed wine bin was holding up the base of a vault on the brink of collapse. An inert human form was lying in the jumble of rubble at my feet. The kid was still howling, in a passion of grief that couldn't be helped. I shouted as loud as I could, Lichtaus! Schnell! Someone came over with a torch, and we saw the body of a woman crushed by the metal of the bottle rack, which had collapsed under the weight of thirty or forty tons of disintegrating masonry. The body of a child was wedged in beside her. Pulling against the stiff, dusty clothes of the corpse, I dragged out the child's body as if it were just another stone. But maybe the kid was still alive. It seemed to move a little. Dragging the two kids with me, I made for the exit hole and handed over the child in my arms to some rescue workers. The one who was howling trailed along with me for a short distance until I abandoned him. He could shift for himself, for God's sake. In Germany, everyone had to be ready for that. The younger, the better. We were already needed for another job. The sirens were howling again. The Anglo-Americans were faithfully adhering to their practice of coming back with a second dose, before we had time to help the victims of the first. The gang chiefs blew their whistles for retreat. Voices were shouting, Everyone take cover! But where? For 400 yards around us, we could see nothing but heaps of rubble. People who knew the district ran in what they hoped were likely directions. Bewildered children were crying. Above us, we could hear the roar of four-engined planes. I was running too, and I knew what I was looking for. The fire truck had disappeared but our heap of packs remained where we'd left them. Soldiers were turning them over, grabbing the right one and running off. I recognised mine by the metal Edelweiss I had sewed onto the piece of calfskin which served as a pillow. I pulled it out, along with my gun. But my gift package. God damn it. Hey, you! My package! Someone threw me a package across the maelstrom. Everyone was hurrying off. Hey, this isn't it! Wait a minute! God damn it! Bombs were beginning to fall at the other end of the city. God damn it to hell! I ran as fast as I could across an empty space where I narrowly escaped a car in as great a hurry as. The surface of the road seemed to be rising and falling in ripples, and the sound of thousands of panes shattering simultaneously 
added a crystalline note to the huge shock produced by bombs of four and five thousand kilos. The number of people on the street was shrinking rapidly. Only a few fools like myself were still running about looking for shelter. My eyes, stinging from the clouds of acrid dust, could see in the intermittent flashes of white light the outline of the houses bordering the street. On one of the buildings I could make out a white poster with black letters. Shelter, thirty persons. Never mind if there were already a hundred. I ran down a spiral staircase between the only two walls left intact in the building. A dim lamp which some thoughtful soul had hooked to the wall lit the turns in the stair, but after two spirals the way was blocked by a large grey cylinder which was even taller than I. I tried to squeeze through the narrow gap next to the stair wall, but a closer look at the object made my blood freeze. I was pressing myself against an enormous bomb whose broken wings indicated that it had crashed through every floor of the building from the roof down. It must have weighed at least four tons and might explode any minute. I streaked back up the stairs and out the door into the darkness, which flickered unevenly into brilliant light like a huge neon sign. Finally, gasping for breath, I collapsed beside a bench in a square and lay there for about twenty minutes until the sirens sounded the all clear. When everything was quiet again, I went back to the job of cleaning up, from which I was released at the end of the morning. Then I was given the most depressing news of all. I was ready to continue my journey westward. Two days of my leave had already been wasted, and I couldn't spare another minute. I asked a territorial where I would find the train for Kassel and Frankfurt. He asked for my pass, looked it over, and told me to follow him. He took me to a military police station. I watched through the little window as my pass travelled from hand to hand, keeping my eyes firmly fixed on it. I saw several stamps being added to the scrap of paper I had brought from Akhturka. Then it was handed back to me, and I was informed, in an indifferent administrative tone, that I could not proceed beyond the Magdeburg sector. Given the location of my army corps, I had come to the extreme western limit of permissible travel. I was absolutely stunned and stood staring at the cops. The shock of disappointment was so great that for a few moments I felt numb. We can understand that you are upset, one of them said, officially taking note of my condition. You will be well taken care of at the reception centre here in town. Without a word, I took my pass from the counter, where the cop had put it down when he got tired of holding it out to me, and walked through the door. My throat felt as if it would burst from the effort of holding back my tears. In the street, where the sun continued to shine, I stumbled on in a daze. I could see that people were staring at me as if I were drunk. Suddenly I felt ashamed and looked for some place where I could withdraw for a few minutes to compose myself. A little farther on, I took shelter in the ruins of a large building, collapsing onto a stone in the darkest corner I could find. Clutching my stamp-covered document, I burst into tears like a child. The sound of footsteps made me look up. Someone had followed me into the building, thinking, perhaps, that I was a thief. When he saw that I was only crying, he turned back to the street. Luckily, people cared more about ration cards than about tears in those days, so at least I was allowed to remain alone with my sorrow. That evening, I caught a train back to Berlin letting fate dictate that I should call on the Neubachs after all. I didn't know where any of my German relatives lived, although at that time they were quite near Berlin, so I was reduced to either the reception centre or the Neubachs. I felt obsessed by my disappointment. I had been looking forward to this leave so much. And I had earned it, too. I had joined the infantry expressly to get it. And now here I was with nothing but a ludicrous scrap of paper. I didn't even have my gift package anymore. It had vanished at Magdeburg, which I had left with a box of some soldier's dirty laundry. Now I would have to show up with empty hands at the house of people I had never met. I certainly didn't have enough money to buy them anything. That evening, I counted myself lucky to get a bed at the reception centre in Berlin. One of the older soldiers there listened to the story of my pass and advised me to speak to a non-com at the registration desk. The non-com turned out to be quite sympathetic, noted down all the details, and told me to come back in 24 hours. Early the next morning, I set out to find the Neubach's house. After several hours of hesitant, groping progress, 
I finally found myself in front of number 112, Killeringstrasse, a simple three-storey house with a gravelled walk beside it, which could be shut off from the street by a low gate. A young girl who seemed to be about my age was leaning on the bottom half of the front door, looking out into the street. After a moment's hesitation, I went over to ask a final direction. Yes, sir, she said, smiling. This is the right house. They live on the second floor, but at this time of day they're all out at work. Thank you, miss. Do you know when they'll be back? They'll be here this evening, after seven. Thank you, I said, thinking of the long day ahead of me. What could I do with all that time? As I shut the gate, I thanked the girl once again. She smiled faintly and nodded her head. Who was she waiting for? Certainly not the Neubachs. I had already walked a short way down Killeringstrasse when it occurred to me that I could, at any rate, have talked to the girl a little longer. After several moments of hesitation, I turned back, hoping that she would still be there. Every minute I could subtract from the interminable day ahead seemed like a minute gained. As long as she didn't laugh at me right to my face, I was ready to take almost any amount of sarcasm. I was soon back at number 112. She was exactly where I'd left her. You think they're already home? She said, laughing. Of course not, but I feel so lost in this town that I'd rather sit here on the steps and wait than have to hunt for the house all over again. You want to wait here all day? She seemed astonished. I'm afraid so. But you ought to look around Berlin. It's an interesting place. I agree with you, I should. But really, I feel so lost, I'm afraid I wouldn't see anything. And I still felt so disappointed that I had no wish to flirt. Are you on leave? Yes, I've still got twelve days, but I'm not allowed to leave the Berlin sector. Are you from the Eastern Front? Yes. It must have been very hard. I can see it on your face. I glanced up at her in surprise. I suspected that I did look like the undertaker's assistant, but for a pretty girl to remark on it after the first few minutes. Then she said something about the people on the third floor, but I wasn't really listening. If she thought I looked as bad as all that, this minuscule conversation that was bringing me somewhat closer to normal life might end at any moment. The idea terrified me. I would have done almost anything to keep this encounter going. I tried to change my expression, to force my mouth to smile, to make myself agreeable. Heavily and clumsily, I asked her if she knew the city. Oh, yes, she said, apparently unaware of the trap I was arranging. I've lived in Berlin since before the war. Then she told me about herself, how she studied for part of the day and was a first aid assistant for an eight-hour shift. She was studying for a teacher's license. I listened, but with only half my attention. The simple sound of her voice seemed to wrap me in tenderness. I only wanted it to continue. I tried to look agreeable. When she fell silent, I thrust home with my question. The technique of a Feldwebel. Since you don't have to be at the first aid station until five, couldn't you show me some of the sights? That is to say, if you don't have anything else to do. She blushed a little. I'd like to, she said, looking down at the ground. But I can't say until I've spoken to Frau X. I no longer remember the woman's name. Oh. Well, I've got lots of time. Twelve days? She laughed. Good sign, I thought. We talked for about an hour until the good lady arrived. We couldn't avoid the war, of course, although I certainly wanted to, but I did my best to embroider what I said. I described heroic deeds the like of which I'd never seen. I couldn't believe that the filth of the steppe was what this girl wanted to hear about, and I was afraid of speaking too frankly. I didn't want her to understand what our experiences had really been like. I didn't want her to catch the stench of mud and blood through anything I said, or to see the huge grey horizon still stamped across my vision. I was afraid of infecting her with my terror and disgust, and afraid that if I did she'd resent it. My descriptions of heroism came straight from Hollywood, but at least we were able to laugh, and I could go on talking to her.